Hello everyone, welcome again to the Ministry of Propaganda, helping you think. Tonight, me and Chris are going to be talking about mainly South America, South American geopolitics. There's, a lot been, there's been a lot going on. Um, obviously, it's the first broadcast of the year from us. Uh, we had the, let's call it a coup, maybe it's insurrection, we'll talk about that. The one in Brazil, um, there's been stuff going on in Argentina and Brazil, also discussing a shared currency. Uh, and Peru as well, having uh, the leader of Peru being ousted. Um, by the Congress there. So that's at least some of the stuff we're going to be talking about. Uh, Chris, what did you want to go into first? Um, so I, I think the easiest subject out of the two to sort of understand would be Brazil, I feel. Um, obviously, because we spoke not long ago, actually, about on the subject with Lula in the presidency again, in that episode, we actually theorized of the notion that a pink wave as as the term is coined, uh, follow, following a pink wave historically comes a blue counter wave. That does seem to be what we've seen here in some degree, uh, with varying degrees of success um, in, in both countries. Um, not just in, in both countries, obviously we've seen things in um, places like Argentina as well recently, which we're not really going to go into, but it seems to have been a current that has affected all of South America as is sort of tradition in these sort of movements. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the blue wave to counter the, the pink tide or the pink wave to counter the blue tide, whatever you want to call it, um, that definitely seems to be happening. Um, we had, of course, I mean, if you roll the clock back a bit further, uh, Morales was also kicked out, um, you know, in a coup a few years ago and then, you know, came back and won and then got rid of the, the person that overthrew him and the, the other people that overthrew him. Um, yeah, it does seem that this is what we saw in Brazil. I mean, obviously, there's a bit of um, complexity to it. Uh, I've, I've been reading some people saying that, you know, uh, Lula was funded by Soros. So, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, that's that that means it's an American backed action yeah. bringing Lula. As we all know, Soros funds everything, including the show for anyone who doesn't realize that. Um, yeah, we'll funded that show. yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but realistically, that you can't any movement that has any degree of positivity to it or progressiveness to it you'll always get somebody further left than them claiming that that movement is not worthy of support and it's funded by soros whether it be uh greta thunberg or black lives matter or anything mm. that just isn't up to scratch but is generally good mm. but not mm. Marx enough is instantly branded as a soros funded campaign um, right. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, it, it is, of course, like the go-to of, of right-wingers to say that everything is funded by Soros, and Soros is yeah. the, the mastermind of the, the Jewish cabal controlling yes. the world. Um, so I, I do think that just on that one, if Soros is funding Lula, I think you need to sort of then think about, okay, well, if, if Soros is backing Lula and he's a part of the international Jewish cabal that's running the world, obviously I'm being sarcastic, um, what does this mean for American sort of geostrategic interests if that what is what Soros represents? Um, because Lula is the um, chief sort of protagonist of, uh, of, of BRICS. Uh, he's the guy who signed Brazil up to BRICS, which includes Russia and China. Um, yeah. So it does seem to me a bit of a ridiculous idea that George Soros is putting Lula in place to uh, overthrow, um, uh, you know, the person that Bolsonaro, um, but he's also very friendly with Russia and China. It doesn't seem like a geostrategic, um, a very clever geostrategic move by the Americans, if that is the case, which I don't think it is. Um, no, of course. Yeah. You, yeah. The, your, your fault there is you're trying to apply logic to something that is completely illogical. Uh, like you said, you just hit the nail on the head. They, they do claim, in some cases, that George Soros is, is funding China. These are the same sort of arguments. So people said that the Jews were funding the Bolshevik revolution. It's, it's just not having a grasp on what these movements are or who represents what uh yeah. Yeah. it's just political sort of confusion and unfortunately so many of our comrades on the left seem to fall for it it's the conspiracy mind frame of when you know when you find out that one conspiracy is true you see them everywhere <laughs> that's it that's it i i mean yeah i think you, i can't actually cover that any better than you have um, just to give some substance behind this, this is from the uh, Silk Road briefing, this one here, and this is from TASS. So this is the Russian news agency. Just to give some context as 
to what they see Lula uh, representing. This is the Russians, uh, those great friends of the Americans. Um, Brazil's Lula, Lula devows to strengthen BRICS. Um, so this is obviously January 1st. This is the start of the year. Um, so he's, they're quoting um, uh, Lula over here. I'm going to read this quickly. So our leading role will be embodied in the resumption of South American integration on the basis of Mercosur, South America's common market, and on the basis of revitalizing the union of South American nations and other sovereign institutions in our region. We will be able to build an active and productive dialogue with the United States, the EU, China, Asian countries, and other global players. We will be strengthening BRICS and cooperation with African countries in order to end the isolation of our country has been in recent years. So, I mean, it's pretty clear that, you know, he's showing his intention to bring Brazil back into the middle of BRICS. Yes, it does mention the US here. Sure. Um, perhaps yeah. even begrudgingly, I don't know. But the point is, is that it's very much showing um, a positive move to bring Brazil back into that multipolar sort of motion or movement, um, globally yeah. speaking. I think it just shows he's a, he's a multipolarist, which we do love on this show. Um, mm -hmm. You can't, unfortunately, can't have multipolarism without the United States. Uh, they are there, and they are yep. the biggest economy in the world. Uh, like China's always reminds people that we're not here to overtake the world; we're here to equalize it in that sense. And that doesn't mean yep. destroying America or destroying the American economy, which would throw hundreds of millions of people into dire poverty, which again, for some reason, some people on the left seem to want. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Um, I think just, just so that people have definitions of these stuff. So the big discussion, which rolls into the same discussion about the January 6th stuff that happened in America, because of course this coup that happened uh, was, well, we call it a coup. This is the thing. So people like insurrection, coup, sedition, what, what do all these things mean? So let's just do a, a brief one on this. So, um, uh, so an inter insurrection uh, is, let's take a look at According to Miriam Webster, insurrection is the act of revolting against civil authority or an established government. Uh, other definitions from Cambridge uh, specify the act is usually violent. Synonyms include revolt or uprising. Okay. Uh, and of course, you know, they're referencing Mitt Romney, who said this was an insurrection. And indeed, that is what um, some of the charges against Trump in the US are regarding the January 6th, 2020. Uh, incident. Um, but then you have sedition. Okay. Sedition is the incitement of resistance to or insurrection against lawful authority. Okay. That's a code in Webster. Um, okay. So that's basically organizing it. Okay. So inciting. Uh, if you yeah. incite, incite the insurrection. Okay. So these things are very linked. Uh, and then coup. Okay. So a coup, shorthand for coup d'etat, is broadly characterized by Miriam Webster as a sudden, decisive exercise of force in politics, but particularly the violent overthrow or alteration of an existing government by a small group. Okay, so um, yeah, I, there's a lot of people that got into this discussion about was this a coup? What is a coup? Um, and yeah, what do you think, Chris? Uh, so it wasn't a coup. The, it, the, the American press, they're linking it with that word insurrection because it's the word that they've used uh, for January the 6th in, in the state. So they're trying to um, link these events with that word. Uh, these events are very much linked in terms of some of the characters, some of the behaviours, some of the outfits, which we'll show. <laughs> uh, so I'd say sort of sedition, if you were a much more optimistic person than I, you could even potentially call that a counter-revolution if you believed that what Lula represents was a revolution in the first place, which because I don't particularly, some may. Um, but yeah, I think sedition is definitely it. I say it was not a coup. Mm. However, there were people there who were calling for a coup. They were, but like Bolsonaro, he always uh, larped on about his admiration for the previous military dictatorships of Brazil and how great they were. And himself was a military captain. So you can see why he would favor that approach of military rule. Um, and his supporters called for the army to intervene. However, they didn't. So it wasn't a coup. Mm. I see. I see. Yeah. So I think I agree with the, um, the, the fact that it wasn't a coup, but the idea of it being an attempted coup, a failed coup, yeah. a, a group of people that desired a coup, I think that's yes. a coup. Because you have to remember that these um, individuals, the supporters, so the Bolsonaro voters, uh, were camping outside military bases for weeks 
hoping that they would be who hoping that something would happen, asking for the military to do something, asking for something to happen. Um, obviously, the military didn't do anything. So, yeah, I think there's a big point there with those definitions. Right. Usually when people say coup, it usually involves the military, the military forcibly doing something and overthrowing the, the state, um, you know, replacing the, the current government, right? So that would be a coup. It's so rare for the military to be asked to intervene <laughs> and then not to. <laughs> Right. Well, this is the thing. So this is obviously what the, the, the protesters were hoping because what I think it's 21, 21 years. Yeah. I, I might be wrong. About it, but it's not very long that, that Brazil has had, um, you know, multi-party sort of democracy. So, yeah, the, for these people, that wasn't that crazy. Like, you know, you generals who ruled this country not so long ago, uh, please yeah. come back, you know, do, be the leaders again. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think we can say an attempted coup. Um, and I think we can say that, of course, these were insurrectionists in the sense that there was violence. They were trying to overthrow the state with, with violence. They weren't organized. They weren't big enough. Um, and yeah, so yes, you could say attempted coup, but no like attempt from the actual military. So if you compare it to, for example, the Turkish um, one where they tried to get rid of Erdogan and you had tanks on the bridges, you had aircraft dropping bombs, you had buildings, be, you know, actual sort of um, hard, heavy, you know, violence, um, you know, almost warfare. Uh, then that, that was more of an attempted coup, a, f a full, you know, a full packaged attempted coup rather than this being sort of maybe the wrapping paper um, for a coup yeah. they're trying to make into a, a coup. Um, That's it. With Turkey, like I say, a section of the military were involved from the direct part. Obviously, I believe the mastermind of that was in a, in, the, in, the, in the America at the time. I think uh, Caleb Malpin actually interviewed him and he was in Pennsylvania. I forget the state. It's beginning with a P. Uh, but obviously that straight away would have lit his alarm bells that um, a NATO member who's attempted coup leader was safely in sanctuary in America. You'd, you'd yeah. think vice versa, the American government would be demanding the person's arrest. Interesting that that didn't happen. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was something else I wanted to say here regarding coup insurrection. Uh, one second. Uh, well, yeah. So the other, the other thing is, is I do feel a bit sorry for these um, individuals. Obviously, I mean, the, 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 the Financial Times wrote about this, of course, as everyone did. Um, and they sort of described who the, um, you know, the, the, the attempted coup people were, the, the, the violent people that stormed the Brazilian um, buildings, Congress buildings and whatnot. Um, so the thing is, you know, if you look at the rhetoric of Bolsonaro, a populist movement, um, and the description from Russia, from, sorry, Financial Times is, uh, Bolsonaro's populist movement has long relied on radical, highly mobilized supporters who turn out in large numbers for rallies and events. They were a mainstay of his presidency between 2019 and last year, and also protested in vast numbers following his um, narrow defeat to Lula in the October uh, elections. In the days after the vote, many pro Bolsonaro truckers blocked highways across the country, choking supply chains, and at one point forcing the closure of Brazil's main international airport. These hardline backers are nationalists socially conservative and often evangelical Christians. They accuse Lula and his workers party of being corrupt and against family values, claiming the left intends to implant socialism in, in Brazil. So that's at least one account of who these people were. But the important point to make here is that also the military weren't particularly there to help them and you know, to come to their aid and do the coup. But also Bolsonaro himself was, 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 was a bit reluctant. If you read some of his tweets and also the statements he made, they were very vague. There wasn't a sort of, yes, you are fighting for the country, go on, you know, keep going, um, yeah. stand, fight, all kind of stuff. It was more um, vague comments and, and sort of, and eventually he didn't even really uh, kind of backpedal and, and stepped away from them. So on many levels kind of betrayed actually these, um, you know, misguided people. Um, and most of them like, truck stuff, yeah. I feel like on his part, that was a bit of a political opportunism. I can imagine that if it went the other way, he wouldn't have been so oh, quick yeah. to back down. He would have been happy to claim victory if they were successful. He just didn't want to share in their failure. Yeah. Um, 100 Obviously, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Yeah. When he was actually, when this was actually, the event was actually happening on the 6th of January, um, was it the 6th or the 8th? He was actually in Florida at the time. Yeah. Uh, we don't know for definite who he was with, but we know he was a stone throw away from Steve Bannon, Trump, and everyone who plotted the failed insurrection of the capital in America. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to be <laughs> the great Agatha Christie fan to be able to draw these lines together and see that these events, this this is what happens when you plan a 
buy an insurrection from wish.com. This was just a cheap knockoff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, just, just to reference the, um, the shaman. So, um, I should take a look at this image. So, uh, yeah. So of course, as we all know, with the famous January 6th, uh, incident, uh, or, yeah insurrection there was the shaman um but the brazilians got their own shaman we have uh, our uh, shaman from brazil uh there he is lovely very <laughs> similar striking resemblance um so yes one of the jokes that one of us made was of course you know history repeats itself first as sham and then as shaman <laughs> yeah um but yeah what it's, else just you an outfit. <laughs> you know, it's just a shame that they've stolen it the best outfits that the life seems to get when they go to protest is Stolen when they were wearing, dressed up as the Joker from the few years back, from the Jacqueline Phoenix Joker movie. Wait, wait, who, who, who is this? Sorry, in relation to who? Sorry. Uh, so when there were the protests in Chile and there was the protests in not Beirut, uh, there was people turn up at the protest dressed as Jacqueline Phoenix as Joker. Uh, okay. Just the left, uh, the, the left need to catch up with their <laughs> outfits. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the right definitely yeah. have got better, better characters than us. Yeah, I think I think the right wing have certainly got got some good characters going there. I, I like <laughs> Shaman. It's it's a character that inspires you, even if the ideas aren't necessarily the best. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So anyway, but yeah. So just the comparisons. Obviously, one is drawing comparisons between the two, and there are some similarities, but there are some big differences. I mean, one of the big differences is that Lula was already the president, and these poor, you know, misguided individuals uh, decided that they would try and storm. The capital while there was no one there so they did occupy i think all three of the executive branches or sorry not executive branches but the three branches of the government the, the the courts the congress and the presidential palace were all occupied um but it was hollow it was meaningless um, no one was there everything had been done uh lula was the president and bolsonaro also uh was kind of defeated i mean he wasn't he didn't fly in and join in and and no generals came so um yeah you know, there's a lot of differences too between the between the two of these things. Um, obviously, Lula did actually kick out a and fire one of his generals. Um, but from what I read, I don't think it's because that he was necessarily uh, involved or plotted. More to do with the failings of allowing yeah. this to actually happen, allowing them to occupy the buildings rather than it being a political yeah. Um, yeah, firing. A uh, link link here from the a few days beforehand. If you can just you can see if that translates for you, Rich, because it's in uh, Portuguese. Uh, okay. From the okay. Metropolis. It's in Portuguese. Oh, wait, I can. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm using Firefox, that's why. Uh, let me just try. Firefox. <laughs> Firefox. <laughs> but okay, what does it say there? Tell us what it says. If, if... Um, so, extremists talk about invading Congress, dodging police, and giving tips on gas. This article was posted on the 5th of January, so days before. Uh, so, this shows that the police actually intercepted messages between plotters um, of this event talking about how they should do it, what day they should do it. They actually posted that the event should take place on Monday the 9th. Uh, as you know, it didn't end up happening then. Uh, So they talk about how to deal with tear gas uh, if, if they're mates. Uh, but the, the, the police did seem to have spotted it. And unfortunately, this may be why Lula was quick to sort of sack certain people. It seems to have been ineptness of people, the forces, not so much as hoping it succeeds, but not wanting to put it down. Maybe they were scared of a reaction if they did put it down. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I don't know. I think obviously they did have to arrest them, whatever. But the fact that they had occupied an empty building and there was no, you know, the cavalry weren't going to be coming, the army wasn't going to be deployed. Bolsonaro hadn't even moved. I, I think that uh, luckily, yeah. actually, Lula didn't even need to put it down. It just needed to slowly just drag individuals away and just let it slowly crumble. Um, That's the army it. Wasn't going to come. Yeah. These these events, which I feel now are just going to become commonplace after Trump started them. Now it's now it's become a habit at this point of when I'm going to guess it is always going to be the right wing that does this um, because these are symbolic acts. It seems to be maybe based on like the misunderstanding of what a seat of power is. These people seem to think that it is a building that if you take over this building, we're in control of the government now. So yes, 
the power isn't there. The power is in people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, in that sense, it was a very superficial attempt. Yeah. To, yeah. We will occupy. We're going to go to overtake the government. We're going to go overtake the government building. Sure, yes. It's a building. <laughs> but that's I compare that to how a, like a military uh, militia would take land. That to go cast our land about 10 years when ISIS swarmed and took large territory of northern Iraq and Syria in a very short period of time. They did it by taking by holding uh, motorways in and out, train stations, public utilities, communications. If you're serious about taking territory, that, that is what you do. You don't just run up and take over the council building and hope everyone's going to respond to you. Yes. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like if they had uh, gone to the TV tower, uh, the telecommunications company, uh, the power station, uh, yeah. the water, you know, water, water, water pump station, whatever, um, that would have been a much different situation. Um, yeah, yeah they, they that's how you take actually control. Institutions, infrastructure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, so there's another coup uh, which we can talk about. So, this, so we, have, we have a split in the road here um, because we're talking about Brazil. So we could also quickly go over this Argentina and Brazil currency thing. Yeah. Or we could stick on this sort of coup uh, tangent and talk about Peru. Um, I'll, so, which one do you think we should? So just before we do that, just because I, I feel like we're at whichever direction we go, um, I've got a clip here. Um, just sort of show, because we, we've suggested, obviously, that, that a lot of these movements aren't home baked ideas these are ideas that come abroad um obviously with what we said about uh, lula who wants to make better relations with countries that the america america and the west are hostile with like china like russia um mm. so a couple of years back the america appointed their first female general in charge of southern command which is basically an American general in charge of Latin America and South America. Um, and I got a clip of her sort of opinions of her role, really, and the, the role of America in the South. So I just want to play this. Okay. Okay, I'll add that. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, my number two um, adversary in the region, Russia. I mean, I've got... Uh, of course, the countries, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua with uh, Russia relationships. But why this region matters with all of its rich resources and rare earth elements. You've got the lithium triangle, which is needed for technology today. 60% of the world's lithium uh, is in the lithium triangle, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile. You just have the largest oil reserves, light sweet crude discovered off of Guyana over a year ago. Um, you have uh, Venezuela's resources as well with, uh, with oil, uh, copper, gold. Uh, we have the Amazon, uh, lungs of the world. We have 31% of the world's fresh water in this region too. Um, I mean, it's just off the charts. We have a lot to do. This region matters. It has a lot to do with national security. And we need to step up our game. Oh man! I've never seen someone think? almost being brought to orgasm over the talk of lithium deposits, and she was literally salivating at mouth over the thought of these resources that are not theirs. And that, that's what it's all about. It's these countries want to be able to freely trade in a sovereign, free state with countries that America do not like, and they just cannot get it into their heads that. These countries have a right to do so. It's they're still so rooted in the Monroe Doctrine that this is our backyard, and that the only people who can exploit South America is them. And that's basically her job yeah. to ensure yeah. American dominance and hegemony over over the South. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it is bizarre. You're talking. Uh, this is a general who should be talking about security and defense. She doesn't talk about security and defense at all. She doesn't talk about cartels, uh, nope. drug cartels, which really do have a security and defense uh, impact in the States. So, you know, the, yeah. the Colombian drug cartels, the, the cocaine cartels, the Mexican border, which is literally part of it is most of it, actually, if I'm not mistaken, is, is you know, you have the cartels with, you know, military grade weapons having 
you know, gun battles, sort of Taliban yeah. style, um, all over the country. Uh, so that would you think if she's talking about, you know, as she should, a general talking about defense and security, securing the nation, you'd think she would at least mention that, not a word uh, yeah. of, you know, why that region is important or why her region is important to the U.S. All of that was economics. All of that was business. I mean, also, you can actually almost just see how thin the veil is on this use of the word interests. We must protect our interests. Yeah. And what are our interests? They are other people's resources. So, yeah, I mean, lithium triangle in other countries, oil in other countries, oil in other people's territory, um, a forest in other people's territory. I mean, maybe you can, the only redeeming thing she said was about the lungs of the world, I suppose, that, yeah, but that's that's a mutual interest. Sure, that is a mutual interest. Okay, one out of four, and it was the probably one of the last ones you mentioned. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean... Yeah, if you, if you, you know, I mean, you don't even need to read, um, you know, the highest stage of imperialism. You can just watch that clip, and that's enough. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Like the, the using the code word of special interest now, it's completely lost all meaning. The veil of <laughs> of secrecy is gone. Like she, yeah. they, they basically just said it. It's, she might as well have been winking at the camera while saying it. Yeah, uh, we're looking for our interests, your resources, basically. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we saw that. Thank you very much. I was actually, I'm, yeah, I remember you saying that we had that before. So good, good job on getting that up. Um, cool. Any other last ones? Uh, any other stuff you want to share there, Chris? Before we move on to the um, Peru or the Argentina currency thing. Um, yes. Yeah, so let, let's have a swing to uh, Peru and see what's going on yeah. there and sort of how this sort of very much rhymes with what's been going on with Brazil. Sure. 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 So yeah, it, it's very much in the same uh, strain as what we're talking about here. A this one was a successful coup, um, yes. uh, but obviously, if, you know, we're talking about this. This is actually where we, you know, talking about this definition of coup stuff. Um, this one was nonviolent, so uh, the state did it. Um, you know, there was a congress; they passed a motion, um, or sorry, congress passed a motion, and you know, then the the remaining parts of the state, which doesn't agree with uh, Castillo's uh, policies, they um, you know enacted it. Um, so. That's the difference here. So the one, the attempted one, if we want to call it that, in Brazil was just a bunch of disillusioned um, people that have, you know, lost um, their election, lost it. They feel like Bolsonaro should have won. Um, them thinking that they can try and manually take buildings. This one is, you know, a coup from within uh, the the establishment um, using what mechanisms they have, as well as external mechanisms to overthrow them. I'm just waiting for an article to load up here. So, ah, there we go. Um, I'm going to share this one from The Communists. Uh, which is pretty gives a good good description of what happened. Um, so here we go. Yeah. So so I think there's some important points for this one. Is of course it happened in December. So the coup happened on the seventh of December. But there's been protests, so mass protests in Peru, and most of the people supporting uh, Castillo uh, are the poor and indigenous groups. So Castillo himself, being a former teacher and described as a left wing guy. Um, yeah, so how did they do it? Basically, the uh, like I said, the Congress voted him out and then enact, the state enacted it. But what's very interesting is who supports it. So regionally, um, of course, the US supports it and the Organization of American States, um, the European Union, Britain. Um, they've recognized the new uh, government, uh, as well as Canada, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Uruguay. Uh, but what's interesting here is... is Gabriel Boric, Chile. So in the pink wave, when we discussed the pink wave a few episodes ago, we talked about this Gabriel Boric. We were going to talk about that constitution of theirs that was not successfully yeah. passed. Um, and people did describe him as, as being left wing. But there was a lot of discussion as to what kind of left wing he was. And I feel like we're seeing a bit of the kind of flavor and character um, of what that means, that kind of left wing. Because he's literally, he's with the baddies, to put it simple. Um, what do you think, Chris? Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I was straight away drawn suspicious of this left-wing government in Chile with its relationship of Maduro. It seems to now be a um, rites of passage that if you want to be a leftist leader who gets left alone by the special interest groups and sent by America in South America, you've got to cut your hand and bleed on a picture of the Virgin Mary and promise to never do it deals with Nicolas Maduro and that seems to be what he has done and, <laughs> and that and it just shows us it, it's just showing that he's he's pin his colors to 
the American mast in the hope that they'll leave them alone so we can pass whatever light left wing policies that he wants. Like when we talked about that uh, progressive bill that he wanted to pass in Chile, a lot of it was all it was it was socially based. It wasn't based economically. Um, yes. Unfortunately, for so many of the left, that is enough these days. Yes, yes. I mean, we didn't get the chance to actually go into that um, particular constitution, but uh, yeah, you, you're right. You just mentioned it there. They, you know, the criticism was that it was it was so broad and so much of the social yeah. issues were first. Um, at, there were some economics to it. I think it's unfair to say there was nothing economic. There was economic to it, but the thing is, that there was such a broad net, such a big net that its critics and the people who were against it could quite easily just find a weakness and exploit a particular weakness with a particular group. So whether it was relating to abortion and evangelicals or whether it was relating to sort of more uh, settler nationalist types and them losing rights to uh, indigenous people, it was just too broad of a net and it's failed. Um, even though everyone voted to, um, you know, give a new constitution, the one they yeah. wrote was, uh, yeah, a failure. It flopped too big, too wide of a net. Um, yeah. But I, I think if you want to list off here the, the other hand, so you, you do have a nice um, spread then if you wanted to see where do current governments sit in relation to basically um, allowing a right-wing coup, uh, you know, supported by the U.S. We've already listed off the, the people who support that, the nations that support that, the leaders that support that. But on the other hand, you do have Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Honduras, Cuba, of course, Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines all uh, continue to recognize Pedro Castillo. Um, Lula hasn't actually commented it on, on it yet. Um, so, I mean, obviously he just had his own coup, so I think he should <laughs> probably try and be in support of this, but uh, I mean, perhaps he's just got bigger fish to fry. I don't know. The fact they had to deal with his own coup. I don't know. We'll see. I feel like it's tactical. I feel like Lula probably doesn't feel strong enough yet to make in huge statements yeah. Yeah. on neighbors' yeah. politics. Um, so this 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 does show you though that the if you're looking at the spread there of 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 the of the continent, the majority of the nations are you know supporting Castillo. Uh, so the the pink tide is is somewhat holding against this kind of action. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I had a couple other thoughts on this one. Should I go back here? Sorry. Uh, so other thoughts on this one. I just have some contributions. It's basically. Uh, of course, Morales uh, comes out and, you know, he also very much supports uh, Castillo because this is literally what happened to him um, yes. a few years ago, two or three years ago. So he's come out the strongest, actually. Um, but this, this does remind me, though, of the Elon Musk uh, statement when when the Morales coup, the Bolivia coup happened uh, and Elon Musk got in some argument with someone online and then he just said, we will coup whoever we want. And I just think <laughs> that this stinks bad. Um, bearing in mind that Peru is also rich in lithium uh, reserves. So, yeah. Yes. I'm just going to pull that tweet up because that's really important for people to see. The fact that there's a we in there, not uh, the Americans, not the army, not right-wing governments, we. Hmm. The fact that he is including himself in the people responsible for it, because he is. Like, <laughs> we, we, we all know this. Like, he is the yeah. beneficiary of the lithium, of the resources. He is these special interests that the, the Laura, whatever face general was talking about. That's it. And unfortunately, uh, I feel like there's, there's another episode to be, to be had here, but since like the, the eighties and since the end of the cold war, when people have stopped thinking of businessmen and capitalists and these suits with their big bellies and waistcoats and top hats and sacks for the cash, they've revitalized themselves and rebranded into jeans and branded t-shirts. You, you've got your Elon Musk. Now they look trendy. Now they're just like you guys. They're, they're not the same exploitative JP Morgans of the past. It's like they are. They literally are. They have just rebranded and apparently successfully so to the point that people don't think that Elon Musk is an exploitative capitalist. He's literally the richest man in the world. <laughs> you don't get that from not being yeah. the most exploitative capitalist in the world. Yeah. 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 I, was, I think you've got a nail on the head there that he is, he is the special interests that the general was talking about. It's 
for those companies and not necessarily for the workers of those companies. It's for the executives and the people that own yes. those companies. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the protests are still going on, obviously, in Peru. They're, they're fighting. Yeah. Many people have died, so it hasn't come to an end yet. Um, no, that and this yet. could go either way. Okay. Like you said, with uh, Bolivia, obviously, with Bolivia, they exiled uh, Morales, and he came back. So they they straight away learned from that and said, well, we don't want that to come back anymore, so this time we're going to lock him up. Hmm. So he can't uh, righteously return. Uh, this reminds me of, I think it probably reminds Castillo as well in his mind, of the coup attempt against Hugo Chavez, where again, they arrested him, they locked him up for days after reverting the election and appointing uh, some puppet president. And due to public demand, they released him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a heroic uh, return to power. Mm. I, I can imagine that is very much what uh, the left and Peru are hoping is going to happen. I hope yeah. something like that happens. Um, yeah. I've, I've been reading uh, in the Lalkar magazine, which again is uh, the journal of Harper Bra specifically, I believe. Um, he, he wrote in it that, um, ironically, it took the detention and imprisonment some call it the kidnapping of Peru's belligerent president to mobilize the people behind him. And that does sort of strike true that nobody was really impassioned about this man until he got arrested, which is a shame. It took this to become mm. popular. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, that is it. That is interesting. I think morale has also got a bit of a, a publicity boost too, actually, by... Yeah being defeated then coming back and uh, and all of that. But I, I think that in terms of the, sort of, if you're looking the, at, at sort of uh, slightly stepping back a bit, we can see that then right wing, um, often funded or supported by the US um, groups or leaders do these coups all the time. So usually, obviously, it's people within the government, people within Congress, people that are within the, the richer classes of, of these countries. I mean, I make a generalization. I'm sure there's obviously other, other groups too. But... Um, yeah, and so this lends to the question that if this current sort of balance of affairs continues, then you will just continue to have um, fights um, like this, where a left-wing leader wins legitimately, then is overthrown with a bogus charge like Lula or Rousseff were, like, Mor uh, like Castillo is now, or just a sort of standard coup like Morales. Um, so if you don't change um, whether you impose some sort of create some sort of regional strength that can defend sovereignty you will just have perpetually have these things going on um and i think that also that leads us nicely into this conversation about building uh, regionality building the the southern south american pole of the multipolar yeah. world if we want to use that that language um because yeah that this is what brazil and argentina has been discussing this the shared currency the sur obviously it's not brand new they've been talking about this for quite a while actually um yeah i don't know if you want to go into this chris or you want to just have us have a last thing about morales or not um, yes, so just sort of part of the, I feel like, just sort of echo what you said, that I feel this is a great, a great, another great example of what you could almost call the Allende effect, um, the sort of failures of the democratic road to socialism. The, obviously, there's a quote from Mao, which always strikes too in these sort of situations of without, without people's army, the people have got nothing. If you've not got a base who are willing to defend from day one, the gains made by the working class. Hmm. You can't then cry when the armed forces of the opposition take them away. You did nothing to defend it. You knew they were going to. Hmm. You leave the army in control of an opposition. Like we, we pointed this out not long ago, even with the Jerry Corbyn episode where the army, the British army, who have no, who were meant to have no interest in any political party, threatened to coup a slightly left wing political leader if he got in. This is exactly the reason why the uh, Chinese army is not the army of the Chinese state, but the army of the Communist Party. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, no, excellent point. I mean, yeah, this this does actually, yes, that does like ring straight back to the, you know, you, you must smash the state and build your own state. For, otherwise, you, you know, you'll be consumed like the Paris Commune was when the state did yeah. come back. Um, yeah, yeah, de definitely, definitely. Um, Okay, and then obviously that would be one side to it. Obviously, building your own your own um, 
people's army, an army that is not subject to influences of outside or um, influences of, of particular classes that, you know, exploiting classes, let's say. Um, yeah. But I do think also there's something to be said about building regional power, which I think this is what yes. the, the sewer thing is quite important. Because um, uh, it's all well and good building yourself and self-reliance and all that stuff. But uh, having more friends and uh, working together in that sense is, I think, a stronger position. So um, yes. talking about this thing. So this uh, is not the first time uh, that the idea has been floated. Um, they've been talking for, for a while. But basically, the idea behind it is to create a, uh, a currency similar to the euro. So it'll be a, uh, a shared currency. At the moment, um, I believe it would only be between Argentina and Brazil. Um, it's called, it would be called the SUR. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot to talk about here because it wouldn't take place, um, you know, for if we use the euro as an example, the euro, if I'm not mistaken, took from 1990 to 1999, so 10 years in its formative stage. Then on the 1st of January, they launched it in the digital sense. And then three years later, 2002, did you only have the notes and the coins? Uh, and then in that time, they were running parallel to the, the, the old currency, the franc and the Deutsche Mark and, and everything else. So if this does happen, this will take perhaps as long, but um, I think it wouldn't be anything shorter than five years in my mind. Because um, you have to, you know, there's a lot of things to cut out to deal with there. Um, yeah, I mean, when they made the euro, obviously they have this thing about um, the advantages being, you know, it makes easier for companies to conduct cross-border trade. Uh, the economy becomes more uh, stable. And consumers have more choice and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I mean, obviously, with um, uh, the euro, is, the euro is a bit different, right? <laughs> so I think in that yeah. sense, you know, if you, if you look at things like Brexit and uh, other discussions, is that, and if you look at the case of Greece uh, versus Iceland, for example, Iceland still had its own um, currency, even though it's a part of uh, the EU or the European, or European economic area. Um, Greece didn't. So when you have the economic collapse, they were pegged and couldn't print their own money. Um, and we're tied in terms of policy. So I wouldn't say it's a panacea to have this, um, to have a currency like that. Um, the euro being an example of, of how it can go wrong. But maybe you could say that the reason the euro is worse is because of the other institutions that come with being part of um, being part of the EU. Uh, but yeah, what, what are your thoughts on this on the sewer thing, then, Chris? Yeah, so I think having uh, sort of regional currencies is in itself quite a good idea. Um, obviously, the reason why the euro was even allowed in the first place uh, was because obviously after World War II uh, where you had the Marshall Plan to sort of rebuild Europe, it was all American money. Um, the the euro was almost, or the, the, the European economy was almost built on, on American money in that sense uh, and was never seen as a competition to, to the American dollar, but it subsidized it. it, it, uh, it promoted it and cooperated with it. Uh, the, the worry for America of other currencies doing the same thing is that they're doing it almost in spite of the US dollar. America would very much wish that international trade for South America would be always conducted in their currency. They don't want it to be conducted in their own currency or in uh, the uh, yen, yuan, Chinese currency, mm -hmm. or anything else. Um, obviously, very famously, uh, Muammar Gaddafi promoted the idea of a African dinar, which a lot of people believe is one of the many factors um, that sort of solidified the West's decision to have him removed and killed. I don't think there's anybody who watching us who doesn't completely understand that the West was all over that, that it was not a popular rebellion against him and the Arab Spring in general was American-led. So every time I hear any progressive leader talk about having a joint currency with his neighbours, on one hand, good for you. The second hand, I'm thinking, you best be ready because it doesn't mm. bode well for them. They don't tend to have the longest life expectancies after announcing something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to echo that. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... This is not just a an idea put forward by by Argentina and Brazil. There's the the American uh, South American left in general. Um, according to the FT, it says that um, as long a wait wanted to reduce the region's historic dependence on the United States and sees a common currency as a clever way to claim greater economic sovereignty, 
while also pursuing a long-held dream of closer political union. Yeah, but as you said, um, if, you know, the euro is different, you know, there's a France and Britain and Germany, and they're already in the Americans' pocket. They don't really, you know, need to worry about that. But as you said, if it's a nation from the global south, a nation that is not so tightly under the fold of, of Washington, uh, yeah. pursuing independent uh, currency, yeah, then you, I think you should be careful. You'd be scared. Um, so, yes, we all know what happened to Gaddafi. Uh, so, and, and also, I mean, the reasoning is there. The, the, one of the, lo the logic behind this um, is to have a currency that they issue and is seen as a global currency so that they're not, um, you know, pegged to having a finite amount because that finite amount is, is printed by, by the states. Um, so, yeah, I mean, particularly for um, Argentina, they do need this actually more than just for the political and uh, sort of regional um, sovereignty kind of thing um, just because of, of trade and how things have happened in the last sort of three years related somewhat related to the, the, the pandemic um, yeah they just don't have enough dollars us dollars reserves um, in order to conduct trade so they're really struggling they, there's a lot of inflation um, and they are quite keen for this to happen so actually in the, if you, with the, the ft financial times puts out a, a, a sort of diagram showing I'll show you now, actually, um, the sort of financial imbalance between the two. So just on an economic side, it actually right now actually isn't financially beneficial for uh, the Brazilians to do this. It's very much in the interests of the. Um, oh, OK, sorry, I thought it was a computer. I won't show you the diagram, but you, it shows you basically just some charts anyway. So, <laughs> but showing you that um, Argentina uh, exports a lot more to Brazil. Therefore, Argentina has to buy more um, in dollars, and they have less and less dollars. So it's it's causing that sort of financial balance. Just to give a sort of basic summary, um, but yeah, nonetheless, I still think that even though it wouldn't necessarily be the best financial um, interest, just specifically on uh, Brazil, Argentina, I think you could have a lot more benefit by starting the project, getting the ball rolling. And I think it's quite yes. difficult to roll that back um, if Bolsonaro or some other new right wing character comes into power in eight years or four years, and you've already got the ball rolling. Uh, it's quite hard to step back. Uh, and then the US has to try and step it back on a number of leaders. Um, so yeah, I think I think they should go for it. They should do it. That's definitely a symbol of a multipolar world for me is having a new global currency, um, another or maybe a regional currency, let's say. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that is definitely a thing. It, uh, low regional currencies are actually backed up by resources. Uh, I think this year we've seen that the, uh, what I felt was a fad of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies and NFTs. I think that has now shown that it is died a death. Um, I don't think that is the wave of the future as many uh, crypto bros were promising it was, uh, as it would be. Um, obviously, countries like, like China um, have completely regulated against it to try and sort of kill it, <laughs> kill it dead um, because it, it's a threat to the banking system of regional countries. I think smaller banks central banks for smaller countries will be completely sidelined by things like this. And um, so it's good for countries to sort of take their, their sort of economic uh, sort of destiny in their hands and sort of run with it, like, like hmm. by doing these sort of projects. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that obviously uh, the important thing is that, again, I, I mentioned this before is to also avoid it's good to have a regional currency that makes trade cheaper and all this kind of stuff we already mentioned. But if you do start sacrificing um, your government's ability to actually make policy, so if uh, the currency has such a hold on your economy that uh, was organized in such a way that you um, you know you can't sort of issue, uh, you don't have enough funds in order to uh, pursue a particular policy, a social policy, a pension thing, or a new healthcare plan or whatever, because yeah. of how the finances are dictated, then that's when you lose sovereignty, even though you are you are gaining something that gives you an advantage, so uh, cheaper exchanges and cheaper purchases and whatever, um, and you are unable to issue it with you know your seat at the table of the, the central bank that is issuing it, um, that's cool. But if it does mean that you're, you're losing something uh, or too much of your own sovereign uh, economic policy making uh, abilities, then that's that's that would be not that would not be good. But I, I have a feeling that that this would obviously be, um, you know, written and conducted and, and, and sort of drafted in a way that that didn't lead to that. I, I, I don't I don't see them or each regional government shooting themselves in the foot that much. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, of course, 
when you're trading in America's currency, it's very much almost to the point that you're subservient to, you can only really buy what they're legally allowing you to buy. Um, obviously, as we've, we've talked about earlier with Brazil wanting to increase sort of trade to countries that America doesn't like, like China, being able to trade in its own currency would facilitate that. Uh, now, I've seen just in the last couple of hours that it's been a, uh, now announced that Japan and I believe, I think South Korea, um, have joined America's call for export restrictions of chips from China. So this, we've talked about this, how so much of what we're talking about at the moment, it's all based on the same sort of, it's the same game. It's just, it's different sets of the same game. This is all about mm. trying to subjugate China, including what we've been talking about with what's going on in, in Ukraine with Russia. China is their own goal. Taiwan, these are all just separate parts of that. And this trade embargo, which looks like it's starting to take shape, of trying to deny China trading partners and the parts that it needs to function as a modern, technically advanced country, which completely depends on microchips. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think I uh, need to do a bit more research about chips and microchips. I'm not saying that I've got enough depth to talk about tonight, but if you want to talk no. about that next week, I'm happy to, yeah. I mean, also, it is also a bit of a, a digression. You're right, in the geopolitical sense, it's definitely tied to the US's ambitions to stop any other nation taking uh, or, or taking it off of its pedestal and replacing it with anything else, whether that be a multipolar world or anything else. Um, yeah, that, that is the, the current sort of big mission of, of, of the US sort of ruling class and, and, and individuals who are in, in government um, in the civil service and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, uh, I would like to talk about chips another time, actually. I want to do some, we should do a, a, an in-depth discussion about chips, if you'd like. Um, yes, I think it's quite interesting to sort of show the, the vast reaches of this problem and everything that it's affecting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, I mean, the only thing I'd say about Korea specifically is I know that I think it was yesterday or the day before the South Korean, uh, one of the defense ministers or some sort of leader from South Korea was meeting with Jen Stoltenberg um, to discuss, you know, how they can work closer together, which means that now we can finally start talking about the Indo-Atlanto-Pacific um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a as a as a region, you know, um, <laughs> because if, if South Korea can work with NATO, and be a part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, then then we've reached that point of the Indo-Atlantic Pacific uh, yes. type of politics. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, coming up um, next month was going to be the one-year anniversary, if we're going to use <laughs> the term, of the uh, special military operation in Ukraine. Uh, so I think we're going to do, unfortunately, hitting our one-year review of that. I would say uh, so, a birthday. Call it a birthday. Yeah. Uh, birthday. We'll have a cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, yes, that's actually true. Um, that would be, uh, I believe, not the twenty fourth of February, eighteenth of Feb. Uh, yes, yes so in a few weeks. That one. So perhaps next week we'll have chips. Uh, but if you want to leave us some comments about stuff that you think we should cover or you would like us to talk about, then please leave those comments. Hit a like and a subscribe as well. And uh, yes, thank you very much for watching tonight. Thank you very much.